Good evening, everybody. I'm sorry, just to wait a few seconds um, while everybody joins. Um, and first of all, I just want to say thank you and welcome for this evening's talk. Um, and tonight's guest is Adam Forrest, who has been volunteering with the RNLI for 23 years. Let's just take a moment. That is a long time. Um, and he, in fact, works for them now as well. So I think Adam has got an awful lot to share with us this evening. Um, before I hand over to him, um, I just wanted to let you know that Adam left here in 1993. Um, and I was just looking at the Taylorian for the year that he left. And there was a really lovely quote, which I think maybe chimes with his role right now. Um, he was noted as being one of the, but when he worked backstage um, for, while they were putting on the show Grease, um, he was noted as being um, one of the boys who genuinely enjoys making it possible for others to occupy the limelight. And I think that possibly is a very good quote for somebody who works on the lifeboats. Um, this evening, we've also got Panique and Archie, who are both in the lower six, and they're going to be helping to put questions to Adam at the end of his talk. So if you have any questions and you haven't sent them in already, um, do feel free to use the chat and send them to the host and the co-hosts. Um, and really, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Adam and remove my spotlight. Emma, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm almost tempted just to call it quits there uh, after those things you've said. Uh, I, I certainly didn't think that uh, much positive would have been said about my time at Taylor's as a not a particularly academic student. And it was also nice to see Mr. Taylor nodding in, in violent agreement with everything that was said. So I'll take that as an endorsement. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining this evening. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be asked to come and talk about something that is not just my job, but is, is also my, my passion, uh, the, the RNLI. Um, the subject, the work of the RNLI, there just isn't enough time that, that we've got this evening for me to talk about everything that I want to. So quite happy to do more of these over beers at a different time. But uh, what I'm going to do this evening is talk about some of my experiences volunteering with the RNLI and just talk about some of the challenges that we face as a charity and, uh, and what we do to, uh, to try and address those challenges. So before I start, I think I, I'm aware that not everyone knows what the RNI is. Um, I'll make a blind assumption because it's been part of my life for such a long time, but the RNI is the charity that saves lives at sea. Uh, we are a charity. We receive no funding from, from the government. Uh, all of our money comes from, comes from the, the public pocket. We were founded in 1824 by a gentleman you see on the screen, uh, Sir William Hillary, who lived in Peel on the Isle of Man and would, would look out from, from the Isle and see ships being dashed on, on the rocks and haphazard best endeavours attempts by the, by the local population to, to save souls from, from these shipwrecks and had a vision to establish a lifeboat service. And he said that at the heart of this institution would be a large body of men in constant readiness to risk their own lives for the preservation of those whom they have never known or seen, perhaps of another nation, merely because they're fellow creatures in extreme peril. So that was, that was his vision. And 198 years later, uh, we're still here. We look very different to how we did in, in 1824, um, we're certainly not a large body of men anymore. We're, we're a large body of uh, men, women, everybody who wants to be on the crew can be on the crew. Um, but essentially, we are this, the same charity doing the same thing 198 years later. So what I had hoped to do was show a video um, for this next bit, but then I got really nervous about streaming a video and it was bound to be awful. Um, it's a proper Gucci video. It's a minute long. I've watched it a hundred times and it still gets the, the hairs on my arms to stand up because it's, it's awesome. But uh, having just given you the teaser, I can't, I can't show you it. 
So just just as I'm talking, and so you can see how far we've come. This is um, a picture of a, a Liverpool motor class lifeboat built in 1934. So sail, sail and motor, but uh, yeah, 90 year old lifeboat. So the RNLI today, we've got 238 lifeboat stations around the coast of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, including Channel Islands and the Isle of Man. So 238 lifeboat stations served by 458 lifeboats. So in our fleet, we've got 458 boats. Some lifeboat stations have uh, more than one boat. It's normally one or two. Some like Blackpool are greedy, they've got three. Uh, and the remainder are part of what we call our, our relief fleet. So lifeboats that sit in storage, either in headquarters or at strategic locations around the country. So they can be deployed to a lifeboat station in short order, should, should one be needed in the event of a lifeboat being damaged or needing repairs, maintenance, et cetera. So these 238 lifeboat stations during 2020, and they're, they're the last figures that we've got fully wrapped up, launched 8,300 times. They assisted 8,300 people and saved 239 lives. That's just one, one year's worth of work. That works out to one life saved every one and a half days by, by lifeboat crews. And to classify as a, as a life saved, it's not a, not a figure that we, we bandy around or award to a station readily. The, the criteria for a life saved is somebody who, had it not been for the presence of and the action of an RNI lifeboat crew, would certainly have died. So it's, it's, not, it's not just a, oh yeah, we saved him because we picked him up off a, off a floating kayak. This is, this is desperate stuff. So 200, 239 lives saved in one year. We also put a lifeguard service on 177 beaches around the coast of the UK and, uh, and the Republic of Ireland. Mostly seasonal, but we've got one up in Crosby that runs a 365 day a year service. Lifeguards, despite their shorter season, are even busier than, than the boats. 2020, over 10 and a half thousand incidents dealt with by lifeguards. 25,000 people given some sort of assistance by our lifeguards. And in that, that short five month season, when everyone goes to the seaside, they save 110 lives. Same criteria, 110 people who would not be here today had they gone to a different beach on a different day or there hadn't been a lifeguard service. I, th I think that's, that's phenomenal. And it's stats like that that make me so proud to both volunteer and, and work for the organization. This evening's gonna be mostly about lifeboats because that's, that's my world. And I had conversations with people recently and it, it seems that a lifeboat means a different thing to, to different people. So just four pictures on, on the screen so I can try and explain the differences with, between some of our boats. So we've got a total of 10 classes of lifeboat that broadly fall into to two classes or two, two types. So the images across the top of the screen are all weather lifeboats. They're, they're the big, big rigid boats, blue and orange, crew complement, minimum of five. Um, all weather is, is not the best term for that. They're off, offshore boats, they go out range of 200 nautical miles out into the stuff that no one else really wants to go into. Top left is our newest lifeboat in the fleet. It's our, our Shannon class, jet propulsion, 13 meters long, and is normally launched on that SLARS Shannon launch and recovery system that you see. The SLARS rig actually costs more than the lifeboat to build. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic bit of kit. Top right of the screen is a Tamar class lifeboat, so 16 metres long. Uh, and these are the lifeboats that you will see going down the slipway. Everyone's seen them on the telly. Slipway launch down into splashing water. Uh, they can also be, uh, be kept, uh, kept moored alongside as well. And the two boats at the bottom of the screen are two of our inshore lifeboats. So bottom left, the D class, five metres long with a, a complement of three 
this is the workhorse of, of the RNLI. And those of us who are old enough and collected our old milk bottle tops for Blue Peter, the, these were the boats that, uh, that we were buying for Blue Peter. They've been around for, for decades now. Uh, great for inshore work, great for surf work. And these boats save more lives than any other boat in the RNLI. Fantastic bits of kit. And then bottom right, perhaps with my head just in the way, uh, is our larger inshore lifeboat, the Atlantic lifeboat. This is a, an eight and a half meter boat, crew complement of four. And this is what we've, uh, we've got in, in Portishead. So in addition to all our boats, uh, we've also got uh, a fleet of hovercraft, four lifeboat stations operate hovercraft, for sort of mud flats, long, big expanses of sand, et cetera. But the boats are nothing without the people. So at the heart of the RNLI are our volunteers. 95% of all the people who are involved with the RNLI are volunteers, 95%. That's 5,500 operational lifeboat crew, 3,500 operational crew who work ashore. So shore crew, launch authorities, lifeboat operations managers. And then standing proudly Alongside them are 23,000 volunteer fundraisers and other volunteers who raise awareness of our, of our work, give water safety advice and help out in museums, offices, shops, visitor centres, etc. These 32,000 volunteers in, in the organisation, you know, we can chop them up however we want into, into their roles, what they do, you know, go to sea, stay ashore. But we consider ourselves to be one, one crew. It doesn't matter what you do in the organisation. As a, as a volunteer, we're all in it together. And we can't do what we do without, without the others. So there's, there's a real sense of family and togetherness and, and support. And this, uh, this image on the screen now was taken in Manchester last year. So it was celebrating the centenary of the first street collection. Uh, volunteers from all over, the, all over the, the, the Northeast came together and uh, posed, for, posed for that photograph. So, one slide about me, I'm afraid. Um, my volunteering story. I volunteered by accident. I never intended to volunteer the RNLI, but uh, chance meeting in a shopping centre in October 1998 with the crew of Portishead Lifeboat, uh, can rattling, stopped and had a chat with them and they said, we're looking for new crew. I said, well, that sounds interesting. And Bob said, come along. So, yeah, I came along. Uh, and 23 years later, here I still am doing it with as much passion and interest as as I had the day I walked through the door the first time. And I, I was doing some, some maths in preparation for this talk um, and realized I'm three months away from spending half my life on a pager for the RNLI. That's pretty scary. A, because it means I'm 23 times two, which is old. Uh, but yeah, that, that, is, that is a long time. When I started volunteering for Portishead, we were at one of just over 50 independent lifeboat stations that are dotted around the coast of the UK. We started talking to the RNLI in 2008 about adoption. Nothing happens fast in the world of the RNLI. There we are, there's a, there's a trade secret. Uh, and we were finally adopted in, uh, in 2015. So we've been an RNLI station for, for just over seven years now. In that time, I've been lifeboat crew, I've been lifeboat helm, and that is a far fuller of face me uh, on the helm of a, of a lifeboat. I promise you that all the stuff below the face is padding. There's a lot of, a lot of layering going on there. Um, 14 years after being at sea as crew, I decided for various reasons it, it was time to, to come ashore and stopped being crew, but didn't want to stop volunteering. Uh, so since then, I've acted as a, a deputy launching authority. So one of the uh, one of the individuals will take a tasking from the Coast Guard and decide whether or not to agree to launch launch the boat. Uh, and 
currently I'm shore crew at Portishead, so more than happy to jump out of bed when the pager goes off at two o'clock in the morning, go and put the boat on the water, and then sit in the warmth of the boathouse, drinking tea, eating biscuits, waiting for the boat to come back, and then we'll wash down, recover, put the boat to bed, ready for, ready for the next time. So yeah, I've done pretty much every operational role in, in the lifeboat station. And definitely the one that affords the opportunity to drink more tea is, is the one that works better for me. So at Portishead, we're not a particularly busy lifeboat station, uh, but we're not, not the quietest. We, we tend to average about 35 shouts a year. Uh, having a look back, in the time I've been volunteering, the boat's gone out 657 times, 657 shouts. We've assisted 356 people and we've saved 18 lives. Now I was, I was privileged enough to have been involved in saving one of those lives. A, uh, a gentleman who was away on business in Clevedon and had a few beers of an evening and decided that rather than walk the 500 yards back from the beach to his hotel, he would swim despite all advice from, from his colleagues he was with. So in he went and out he never got. And when his friends eventually got back to the hotel and he wasn't there, they called the lifeboat, we launched. It was a dark night. It was a really, really dark night. Sea was, sea was pretty benign, but it was, it was very, very dark. Um, the helm took a really, really brave slash slightly stupid decision at one point to cut the engines and see if we could uh, if we could hear this individual never want to stop our engines when our when we're at sea just in case they don't start again but he did and in the silence we heard cries for help and this this individual had had the huge good fortune to have been pushed on to pushed onto some rocks so i was tasked to go onto the rocks and assess the casualty uh, my assessment of him was conscious, which was good, um, drunk and cold. He was just in his box of shorts. This was October time. Uh, lucky, lucky to be alive. So my job then was to keep him conscious and try and warm him up while we waited for a helicopter to come and extract him. He was in no fit state to get from the rocks onto the boat himself. So the only way he was up. So a helicopter came, uh, took him away. but. I can honestly say I'm no prouder of that life we saved than any of the other 17 that we've saved as a team over the past 23 years. It is, it is a team effort. And when, when the boat comes back and we go, yeah, that was a life saved. Even if you weren't there at the time, the buzz it gives you because of what the team has done is, I can't describe it. It's it's it is a privilege to be involved in in something like that. It 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 really really is. But they they're not all as exciting like that as that. So if you were to ask me, what's a typical shout at Porter's Head look like? This this image. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to move myself. There we go. This this image sums it up beautifully for me. So Porter's Head is at the uh, at the Bristol end of the Bristol Channel. Up the top, we've got the commercial ports of Avonmouth and Portbury just up the way from us. So lots and lots of big commercial shipping in a narrow shipping channel uh, coming and going on the tide, which presents us with some challenges. But the bulk of our trade is pleasure craft, be that motor or be it sail. And oh, we've, we've probably seen it all. Mechanical failure is, is a, a, a bread and butter job, mechanical failure, which can either be actual mechanical failure or it can be a code that when, and I'm, I'm gonna stereotype awfully here, but you're gonna have to bear with me because it, it, it's true, but mechanical failure is code for the husband going, we've run out of fuel, but please don't tell my wife that because I've told her it's mechanical failure. So mechanical failure, out of fuel, We've been called out to boats on fire, uh, crew, especially uh, skippers on, on single-handed sailors, 
who are just absolutely knackered by the time they by the time they get to us they're exhausted and they they've had enough um sickness illness all manner of uh, of injuries people being bashed on heads by bits of boats lacerations broken bones etc or just people having a, a bad day and it it's not going right for them and it normally results in in what you can see here a, a long tow home so we, we we will take the casualty to the nearest safe haven which normally is portishead because options in that part of the bristol channel aren't great unless the tide's right and you can and cardiff is closer certainly not glamorous sometimes very tedious especially when you're managing to tow at two knots and you've got four miles to get home but you cannot put a price on the look of relief and the gratitude when you arrive on scene and uh, and the casualty knows that uh, the lifeboat's here to, to come and help them out past couple of years we've seen a really big increase in more accessible water sports so kayak kayaking stand-up paddle boarding and open water swimming has, has really really taken off the calls that we get to those individuals normally always come from somebody on the shore who's seen a kayaker in difficulty or seen a seen a swimmer in difficulty and when we get to them they're actually fine but it's quite a new thing to see kayaks and, and open water swimmers in in our part of the bristol channel so pe people like to put the call in um i, I talked a minute ago about people having a, a bad day so here's a here's a story about somebody who had three bad days in a fortnight so I first met this individual six o'clock in the morning. Um, he had left his moorings in, uh, in the River Avon and decided to sail down the Avon and out into Bristol Channel and have a lovely night out of it, I guess. Um, he managed to get down the River Avon fine. So he sailed, he sailed fine down the River Avon, perhaps not accounting for the fact that there was tide and rivers flow to the sea so when he tried to turn around and come back up the Avon he couldn't he just wasn't a good enough sailor to get back to, to where he, he wanted to go to uh, so he made contact with the signal station at Avon mouth and said I, I can't get back I'm gonna have to swim for it can you keep an eye on me please while I while I swim in signal station managed to prevent him from doing that uh, called us out, we towed him back home. Just over a week later, he decided to go for another sail. So he slipped his moorings, and I, I suspect there was perhaps a bit too much faffing around going on. And before he could actually get, get himself going, uh, he got pushed onto the mud, ebbing tide, left him there high and dry. But he was within two metres of his mooring, so... No real drama for him, but uh, we, we did stand by just to make sure he got on his mooring. OK. Um, and then the final, final time we met him, about five days after that, he got out of the river, did some great sailing and then ran aground just off our slipway. So you, you can see us here, just uh, coasties on the shore, keeping an eye, us just waiting for the tide to turn so we can refloat and, and take, this, take this boat away. That was that was the last dealing we, we had with this particular vessel. He, he made the decision after the third time and words of advice from the harbour master that perhaps boat ownership wasn't wasn't for him. But uh, yeah, he, he was a, a regular runner for for a good couple of weeks. Occasionally we get to work with helicopters. Now, when when we train with helicopters, this you can guarantee when the message goes out helicopters coming overhead on Sunday morning. Every single volunteer, suddenly all the plans and excuses they normally have for not getting out of bed on a Sunday morning disappear because everybody wants to train under a helicopter. It's brilliant. It's, ah, oh, you cruising along with a great big helicopter 50 feet above you, winter and coming in. I would do it all day long if I can. It, it's, it's such a massive buzz. But when it's for real, it's a completely different kettle of fish. The only reason we get a helicopter overhead is because someone is really, really poorly and needs 
extracting as soon as we possibly can. So this job, we were, we were tasked to search for a person in the water in, in the River Avon. So the lifeboat launched, found the individual, brought them back on board. Uh, because of the nature of the tasking, a helicopter was, was already on its way to, to support with the search effort as, as well as any evacuation that was needed. So you can see in, in the image that the winchman on the end of his rope just being uh, just about to be uh, dropped onto the lifeboat. Can't see any lifeboat crew in there. You can't see a full complement because they are on the deck of the lifeboat giving CPR to, to this individual we've just pulled out of the water. So one crewman with a bag valve mask and oxygen and one giving chest compressions, which leaves the helm sort of on their own, desperately trying to hold position in a narrow channel with downdraft as this helicopter comes ahead. We normally like to do our transfers with a helicopter at speed, uh, with the helm looking at the helicopter and everybody else looking out. But everybody's busy, so the, the helm has just got to do the, the best he can to, um, to keep sight of stuff. And it all went okay, we, we got him off and it was, uh, it, it was a, a good job well done. And every now and then we see the stuff that we never think we'll ever see. So here is it's a, a, it's a pleasure vessel that's, uh, that's sunk just outside the, uh, the entrance to Portishead Marina. These sorts of jobs, there's not a lot we can do about. We, we are there to save life. We're not salvers. So any requests to, can you just pump her out, mate? I think she'll be right. Or I think I left my car keys in the wheelhouse. Could you possibly go and get them? That's a, a stretch too, too far for us. So we, we save life. Um, in, in this instance, we were just, just making sure that this thing wasn't going to drift too far as we did help put some lines up against the pier just so it, it didn't move. But um, it's the only photo I've got in my entire back catalogue of a, of a sinking ship. But that's not to say that we, we haven't been called out to reports of so. I, I remember we were called out to uh, reports of an upturned vessel, white hull, in the channel. So I was helm, off I went, and sure enough, we see what looks like a submerged hull of a vessel, and we get alongside it, and it's a fridge. It's not a vessel at all. Now, I have read enough crime fiction and I've seen enough stuff on the telly to know if you find an abandoned fridge you do not open that fridge so towed it ashore mainly because of it it's it would be a hazard hazard to, to nav navigation especially for small small craft so took it ashore left the coasties to open that and we had a spate of call outs for clusters of people in the river all wearing life jackets floating along. We had about three in a season, all turned out to be bundles of party balloons. And just last year, we got called out to absolute guaranteed, definite sighting of a person drifting down the channel, waving for help. So the lifeboat launched, went and looked and got to, got to the point where we calculated the casualty would be and a tree was floating down the river. But as tree was moving in the waves, the branch looked exactly like somebody waving. We get loads and loads of these, these calls that are reported as something and actually aren't that at all. But there's a, there's a brilliant quote from the old coxswain at Holly Head, which really resonates with me. He said, I'd sooner go a hundred times for nothing but disappointment than once have a life lost for want of me being there. So first message I will, oh, oh, sorry, that test page every Tuesday, I should have thought about that and turned it off. God. Um, so yeah, I'd sooner go a hundred times for nothing but disappointment than once have lost a life for want of me being there. So the message that I would give you is if you are on the coast and you see something that could be something, but you're not sure, and it doesn't sit right with you, please, 999-112, ask for the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard can deploy the most suitable asset to go and have a look, because I'm sure you'd much rather have it checked out than not, and nobody would, uh, nobody would ever, ever hold it against you for, for that false alarm with good intent. So there, there's a bit about 
Porter's head and some of the stuff that I've, I've seen and done. And I want to, to talk about some of the, some of the challenges that, uh, that we face as an institution. I should probably have put the slide up and then fed into that really because I've talked about the challenges that we face and then I've put a photograph up of all my crewmates. So that's, let me, let me explain. Um, here are the crew of Porter's Ed from a couple of years ago. Every single person in this picture is a volunteer. These are just ordinary people doing extraordinary things. They've all got jobs, they've all got families, they've all got other interests and commitments, but they still find time to volunteer to provide a lifeboat service at Porter's Ed. So if, if I just I just call out a few, a few job titles as I as I go through the faces. So got health and safety manager, they're the worst, uh, electrical engineer, sales engineer, chief executive, school chaplain, software engineer, personal assistant, accountant, there's a dentist, got a social worker, a laborer, civil servant, builder, biochemist, university lecturer, paramedic, musician, fireman, railway engineer, bunch of salesmen towards the right. Um, got a nurse, uh, we have got a school head teacher, building surveyor, whole range of, of careers there. And I haven't called them all out, but none of, none of them are mariners. Some of them, sure, I've got boat experience, but none of them are seafarers in, in the traditional sense of you know, your lifeboat community, the lifeboat being crewed by the, the fishermen of the village who, uh, who live the sea, work the sea and, and volunteer on the sea. And almost across the, the, the entire R&I population, that, that's the case. Our, our, our seafaring communities have dwindled and the demographics of coastal life have changed. So a lot of our volunteers are exactly like the people we've got at Portishead, which means we have to make the most of every training session we do. And we've got to do enough to keep people competent without it being unrealistic in terms of time. So, you know, Give, give credit to, to these people who they will, they will stick and stick until, until they get past that as competent. And it, it, the personal sacrifices are massive. I uh, just explain. So here is, here is an old lifeboat, 1952. And anybody who's a bit boaty can probably look at that and go, yeah, there's a wheel, clinical compass, yeah, okay. So I've got engines that will go, stern ahead or stop got some nice mechanical dials and gauges i've got a radio a few new boats a few new, new motor boats you'd have a pretty good stab at making that go and doing it what you want to do and in in the the older world of the rni that's exactly how it was the fishing community who operated boats wouldn't have any real difficulty in operating somebody else's boat it would be like me borrowing my neighbor's car you know i know I know how cars work. There'll be a few subtle differences, but I could drive his car and I know the local roads, so I know what I'm doing. So compare that with what the inside of a lifeboat looks like today. So this is the wheelhouse of one of our Shannon class lifeboats. So the newest lifeboats in the fleet. I mean, it baffles me every, every time I go aboard one at the, the complexity of the systems in, in this boat. The, the mechanic who's, who sat just, just on the right, back right, uh, back left, can tell the coxswain who sat forward right every single thing you would ever want to know about the condition of every component of that lifeboat without him leaving his seat. The data is just coming at you as fast as you want it. And if you don't like the data you've got there now, touch screen and you can get the data you want. I, I couldn't get a, a good shot of the, um, of the helm, helmsman's console, but similar in terms of complexity. The, the nav screen that, that you can see back right is uh, you know, all, all electronic. So how do we take your, your dentist, your civil servant, your school chaplain, your school head teacher, and turn them into lifeboat crew. You can imagine the amount of time and effort that they need to put into their development, but also how important it is that the training that we provide is 
adequate without being over the top. But just just to give you give you an idea, if you wanted to be uh, an all weather lifeboat navigator, you've probably got two and a half years on a on a basic crew plan, and then another couple of years on an nav plan. So from the first time you walk through the door, it could be five years before before you you sit in that seat. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's an awful lot of effort. But of course, the people. And the kit is just one thing. But what we have no control over is the environment that we work in. The sea is unforgiving. If you ever meet a lifeboat crew who says they're not scared of the sea, I would, I would call them out as a liar or foolhardy. The sea is to be respected. The sea has no mercy and the sea can change in an instant. So many years ago now, I was out on a on a training exercise. It was called a, a rough weather handling exercise. We knew it was going to be tasty, so we knew what we were letting ourselves in for. And off we went. We had a great time, um, and then we had to turn around and, and come back. And for for those who don't, don't know the Bristol Channel, when when everything conspires against us. We get waves that, you know, very short wavelength, but really, really deep, deep, deep wave depth. So I was I was coming back to, to the boathouse for, for a cup of tea, thinking about Sunday lunch down the pub. And these were these waves were were huge. And it was it takes all your concentration to climb the face of a wave, making sure you've got enough power to keep going because you don't want to fall backwards. But without going too fast, so you tipple over the, the top edge. So I'm working my way up this wave, and then I feel a tap on my shoulder and a voice on the intercom from Andy sat behind me. He says, Whatever you do, don't look behind you. So taking his advice, I look behind me. And at this point, I must warn you that lifeboat crew are like fishermen in our tendency to exaggerate when we spin yarns like this. But we we have we have collaborated consent since. I swear, the wave coming up behind me was at least a boat length in height. So we're talking eight and a half, nine meters of water coming towards me. So I did learn something at school. A cubic meter of water weighs a ton. So I've got tons and tons and tons of water that's going to potentially come down the life. But if that comes down on us, well, there's only one way it's going to end, and that is extremely badly, which puts even more pressure on me now to make sure I get up the wave, up the wave, so I'm really giving it max effort. But if I go too far over the top, I've got an equivalent fall the other side, straight down. Gravity will take me to the bottom, so I've got to get to the top, hold it, come down with the wave, but then make sure I don't dig in too fast so that the next one doesn't come down over the top of me. Uh, so we got through it, it was okay, but that was that was one moment when I got back to shore and thought, blimey, that was, that was close, that was close. And then we exaggerated and we told everyone they were 20 meters high and you know, really made a thing of it so that they bought the beers in, in the pub. I, I, I make I make light of it, but the fact is we have lost lifeboats and we have lost our people over the years. It's it, it has it has happened. So this is the old lifeboat station at Penley. Last time a lifeboat went down that slipway was the evening of the 19th of December 1981. That lifeboat never made it back to that boathouse. Those doors closed on a, on an empty boathouse. The Solomon Brown lifeboat and all of her eight crew were lost. The Union Star, which was the merchant vessel that the lifeboat went out to assist, also went down. All eight crew on board lost. That's the last time that we've lost a boat and a whole crew. It's 40 years ago, but that still sits front and centre in the mind of every volunteer and every member of staff every time 
we think about ever committing people to a lifeboat to do anything. It's still really, really fresh in our memory, the, the, the lifeboat disaster of, of Payne Lee. So what can we do? What can we do to support our volunteer crew with minimal maritime experience who often put to sea in dangerous conditions? Well, we provide the best kit and equipment that we possibly can. We're constantly innovating and work with suppliers. So people like Crusaber, the, the life jackets that you'll see on all our classes of lifeboat have been designed for the boat and the tasks in mind. We just make sure that we provide the best kit to everybody. We design and build our own boats. All lifeboats now are, are manufactured in-house. Inshore lifeboats at Cowes and all-weather lifeboats in our all-weather lifeboat centre in Paul. So that's what you can see on, on the screen now. So half a dozen Shannon-class lifeboats in, in various stages of build. And at the back end, there's a, a Tamar just being uh, refitted or, or repaired. All, all done in-house. So we've got control over, you know, we're our own design authority and we, we can continually innovate as, as we go. So we had a, a discussion at work the other day saying, would, would Penley happen again? If you took the same, the same weather on the same day to the same job with one of today's boats, how would that pan out? Would the decision have been made to launch? Certainly. Would the crew be trying as diligently as they tried back in 1981, every possible attempt made to save life at sea? Absolutely. But with the faster, more powerful, more maneuverable lifeboat, would they have had a chance to have done that job and got home safely? Almost certainly. So we, we continue to evolve to make lifeboating safer and safer and safer for people. So as, as well as the, the training that I, I mentioned briefly, the, the core skills, uh, we also teach the more rough and ready survival skills. So this is, uh, this is our, um, our sea survival center in Poole uh, with a bunch of crew on the crew emergency procedures course. So floating around in bowlies, and life jackets, about to get in life rafts. Looks pretty fun, doesn't it? So that water is cold. That is cold, cold water. The pool can generate waves, so it can it can replicate some pretty pretty exciting sea states. Uh, the blinds go down, the lights go off. All sorts of dramatic stormy noises are played over the uh, over the speakers. Down the right hand side, you can see three fans so we can generate some proper wind as well. Uh, and the guy stood in the wetsuit on the left-hand side of the pool. When you do your briefing, he introduces himself to you as the pool lifeguard. Hi, I'm Josh, and I'm the pool lifeguard. His actual title, although unofficial, he is the rainmaker. So just when it's going really, really bad and you're being spun around in the dark, disorientating waves, he will provide the most high powered directional rain from a fire hose you've ever seen, just to really, really make that experience a whole lot more miserable. It is a, a totally immersive experience. And we do that to provide a dose of as real as possible so that if it ever does go wrong, at least you've done it once and you've got a pretty good chance of, uh, of getting yourself out of your situation. So it's still in the pool, our all-weather boats have got self-writing capability. As I say, if they tip over past their centre of gravity, they'll, they'll pop back the right way. Uh, it's not something that we, we can train with, don't really want to be doing that. Inshore lifeboats can be righted and restarted, but it's a, it's a very manual effort. So again, we, we train on this, we put people through the capsize course, um, again, so give you a chance to do it in a pool because you can't learn how to do this from, from a textbook. So what you can see here, it's a bit unrealistic because the four crew actually know they're going to capsize. So they're all in appropriate positions, ready to go. The rainmaker presses the button on his crane, flips the boat over, and then the four of you are underneath the boat. You can start to sort out your, uh, sort out your recovery procedures. Out you come, round the back, 
pull a piece of string and the boat will write itself. For the curious, this, this is how it works. There's a large bag on the A-frame of, of the lifeboat, which fills from a CO2 cylinder. And all it's doing is altering the center of gravity of the boat. So it eventually pops over, the crew can climb back on board. And on an Atlantic class, it's pretty easy with the, uh, the systems that we put into the engines just to, just to get them restarted again. And then off, off on their way, probably feeling a little bit shaken up, but uh, at least they can they can do it and get going again. Right, my warning for the next slide. Um, I promise you it's makeup, but if people don't like, it's not even gory. There's a fo fo photograph of some simulated facial burns. So if you don't like it, look away now. But there is a, there is a, a point to this. RNI crews are very often the first and only people on scene at offshore medical events. So we can be required to carry out some fairly significant life-saving interventions. Yeah, the, your worst case scenarios, your unconscious casualty is not breathing or you, your casualty with a catastrophic bleed that needs immediate sorting out. We deal with all sorts of serious injuries for amputations, fractures, facial trauma, et cetera, certainly in the, the commercial, the fishing, the fishing sector. We could be called out to an illness, be that anything from seasickness to a stroke. And we've got to deal with issues relating to people being immersed in water. And not many of us are doctors, very few of us are, are, are doctors. So we've got a really good casualty care course, which is based on a system of check cards that we use to assess the casualty's condition, diagnose what might be wrong with them, save life where we need to save life, and then certainly prevent any deterioration until we can get the casualty handed over to professional medical care. And that's where the helicopters really, really come into to good use. It's a three-day course, lots of theory, lots of practice, but then the final afternoon, the, the trainer gets out the makeup kit and gets out the toy box and creates some really realistic scenarios that we can use to build confidence. Yeah, there are some, this is probably the, the tamest photo I, I could find from, from a, a course that, that we did a few years ago. But everybody hates role play when it comes to first aid at work courses. I, I don't know many who, who really relish it. So by using the moulage, the makeup and props and squirty blood, et cetera, et cetera, just gives us a chance to immerse ourselves in, into the, to the realism of it. So what's, what's the result then of providing best training, best boat, best kit, and best, best we can med care to our volunteers? So this is some of the crew of Triada Bay Lifeboat Station up in uh, Anglesey, just outside Hollyhead. Last summer, they were called out in extremely rough weather to a, a surfer who got stuck in, in the bay there. Uh, it was it was horrific. You can the, the videos are, are on our on our website. Uh, you, you can watch them. It, it was like a washing machine, and I certainly would never have wanted to have taken a, a boat out in those conditions. But with the best boat and the best kit and the best crew on the day, it was a su successful outcome. And that surfer was brought back to shore to go back home to her family and live another day and surf again. Uh, it was. It was a really, really impressive effort. All four crew on the boat that day have been awarded medals by the institution and everybody involved on the shore from launch authority, shore crew have been given some sort of commendation from, from the institution in recognition of the fact really that if this was given to you as a, as a tabletop exercise in your launch authority training, you'd go, no, we can't launch today. That's, I say no to that. They took some really, really careful balanced decisions based on the need and what they had available, and they saved a life. But the, I think the real reason I want, want to share this, this slide in particular, because there are so many examples of, of people doing amazing things. So the, the guy sat down at, at the front, the one with the, the more junior beard of, of the four, Mike. So Mike, Mike works for me in, in my team. And... I was given the nod about his, his medal. And I phoned him up 
and he was very coy about it. And I eventually got him to spill the beans. And I said, just to give you a heads up, Mike, in the team meeting this morning, you're going to be telling everyone or, or I will. And when Mike told the story, the, the humility in which he told it, ah, oh, well, there was this job, it was a bit rough. Well, we did what it was all down to the helm, it was all down to so and so. Nobody in, in the RNLI likes being called a hero. We do what we do because we love it. And when we get to do a job like that and make a difference and take somebody home so they can go home to, to their loved ones. Yeah, all the reward we need is knowing that uh, is knowing that we've done that, and it's yeah, absolutely fantastic. And incidentally, this is the, the first ever shout in the Iron Lies history where uh, the helmsman has been awarded a silver medal. That's normally the, the domain of the all-weather lifeboat coxswain. So, absolutely fantastic effort. So I am I am creaking towards the end, but it would be remiss of me not to talk about what I've got the opportunity, one of the biggest news stories that, uh, that's affected the RNLI over, uh, over the past couple of years. And you know, I'm going to put the politics of immigration and the ethics of people trafficking so far aside, we're, we're not even going there. And this is me talking now as a, as a volunteer. So yes, I'm a staff member. Um, I echo the RNLI's position, but me as a volunteer, I, I say to anybody who, who wants to talk to me about the migrant work we're doing, crossing the channel on an overloaded small boat is not easy and it is not safe. Otherwise, we would all be doing it. We would all be jumping on little dinghies at Dover and popping over to Calais, loading up with booze and fags and coming back. The English Channel is one of the busiest shipping channels around the coast. Massive, massive ships coming and going all the time. You know, strong currents, rough seas, and to put 30 plus people in a boat that, you know, look, I look at that, I wouldn't want more than six people in that. It's, yeah, if we don't continue doing the work we do in the channel, human beings will die and they will die in numbers because we can't control, nobody can control these people coming into boats and coming up. They're, they're, going, they're going to come, they're going to come because they, that's, that's, that's their goal. That's, and they're, they're being sold places of which they will come. If we do nothing, human beings will die. And so William Hillary said in, in the founding articles that, that were voted on when, when the institution was founded, is that the subject of all nations will equally be objects of the institution as well in war as in peace. So speaking now as a, as a crew member, I would say that no RNLI crewman would ever stand by and watch anybody drown, whether they be migrants, whether they be the bunch of lads who've just physically and verbally abused the lifeguard on their way down to the beach with their inflatable unicorn and the lifeguard's gone, don't really think you should be putting that in the sea and they get a whole load of abuse and maybe a push and a shove. When they get into difficulty in 10 minutes time, no one will have any hesitation in going to save them and prevent them from dying. You know, we see the, the people going out in their boats that are just so obviously unseaworthy. There's no life jackets. There's no sign of any sort of safety equipment. Are you sure you want to go out in that? Have you got any life jackets? It's fine, they'll say. We've been out once or twice using hand signals to tell us whether it's once or twice. Um, and then they get halfway, halfway to Cardiff and they get into difficulty. We don't care. We will save them. We will save anybody no matter who they are, no matter how they ended up in the water, because that is what this charity stands for. So that was a bit ceremony. So take, take a breath now. I've got literally two more slides and then we are done. So having shared some stories with you, it's now for me to ask you for some help. Now, what I'm not going to do, I'm not going to ask anybody to donate. I, I promise you, I'm not. I understand that charitable giving is a very, very personal thing. 
and everyone has their favorite charities and everyone has their commitments. And just because I've come and spoken to you about lifeboats doesn't mean all of a sudden you've got to dig deep and give to the lifeboats. Uh, but if you ever did want to, that would be great. Other things you can do to support us, if ever you fancy a weekend in Paul, you can stay at our lifeboat college, which is a fully functioning hotel. Um, all views look out over Holes Bay. Uh, you can tour all weather lifeboat centre. You can tour the Sea Survival Centre. And if you happen to be there when there's crew there, they will be more than happy to share more lifeboat stories with you. Um, and perhaps after this evening, you might have been inspired to volunteer. So many things you can do as a volunteer for the RNLI. So if, if you're interested, please get in touch. But what I'd really like to do in, in the last couple of minutes is just give you some key safety messages that I would like you to take away and, and share. So in the UK, every year, about 140 people accidentally drown. 140 people a year. Half of those people never even intended to be in the water. 70 people a year drown. And they didn't even think they were going to get wet that day. So to prevent you from being one of those statistics, I would ask, if you're going to go to the beach for a day, please, please try and go to a lifeguarded beach. It doesn't even need to be an RNLI lifeguarded beach. Go to a lifeguarded beach so someone's got your back. If you're into your water sports, boats, sups, kayaks, what have you, make sure your kit's in good order. Make sure you know how to use it. Always please take a means of calling for help. That only needs to be these days, a mobile phone in a waterproof pouch with the What Three Words app installed on it. You can tell someone where you are and we can come and find you. If you're out walking on the coast, please check the weather, check the tides, and become a statistic of, of tidal cutoffs. And the, the last piece of advice is if you do end up in the water, we, we are promoting a, a system called float to live. So theory being, if you end up in water unexpectedly, um, cold water shock can quite often lead to involuntary, rapid breathing, panic, and drowning. So we say, take a moment, relax, easier said than done, compose yourself, and then float on your back with your arms and legs outstretched like a starfish. You will float, I guarantee you will float, and you will float for ages. This works. I know it works because the crew of Portis Ed were volunteered to do this live on breakfast TV a couple of years ago, six o'clock in the morning, in front of a live TV audience, three of our volunteers jumped into the marina in Portis Ed with all the pressure of the camera and the nation on them and all the pressure of the towel carriers at the back doing everything we possibly could to put these people off but they floated it works and we've got numerous case studies now of, of this working and this is this is the this is the, the closing part this is an absolute belter of a story so this is Ravi who's 11 years old at the time lives in Leeds so in, in shore lad um, went to Scarborough for the day but his dad uh, and ended up in the sea. Ended up in the sea on his own. So Ravi can swim, but he's not the strongest swimmer. Uh, he remembered the TV advert, the RNLI's float to live TV advert. So he floated, arms and legs outstretched on his back, kept himself entertained by singing. Um, and he was still floating when the lifeboat found him almost an hour later. Had he tried to swim, or do anything other than float, I wouldn't be able to tell this story. It really, really works. We've got videos about it on our website. Please, if you just take one thing away from today, learn about floating to live, share the message far and wide, and you can play your part in reducing accidental coastal drownings around the coast. I'm gonna pause for breath now. I'm done. I think Penny and Archie are going to be my, my question masters. Adam, thank you so much. I'm just keeping an eye on the time and we've had really a lot of questions in and I'm thinking, just in case your bleeper goes off again and you have to run for the door, um, I'm wondering uh, whether Panit and Archie might be able to select a couple of questions um, and we can certainly put the other questions to you perhaps at a later date. And I should also say that Adam has very kindly offered to come to um, the Yard Arms Festival by the Lake. So he will be here in June 
I might be able to answer a few more questions. But anyway, over to Archie and to me. Um, so the first question we have is, um, has climate change had an impact on your work with like changing coastlines and stronger storms? Has that impacted like how you guys go about things now? So that's that's a really that is a really good question, and you know I I'm not an expert in these things, so I, I can only really talk about what I have observed in in my my 23 years of, of volunteering. I think in respect of changing coastlines, not significantly, and we're used to coastlines and seabed topography changing all the time, especially in areas where where we've got seabeds made out of mud or sand. Things things quite often shift around, which which we account we can account for. Um, in terms of stronger storms, I mean, we've certainly seen an increase in some pretty big storms, but generally we find that people won't go out in those sorts of conditions. We don't get called out more in, in the big storms than now than, than we ever have done. I mean, yes, there, there are more of them and that, that might become the case, but uh, yeah, people are generally sensible, won't go out in those conditions. and. Yeah, Despite the fact our all weather lifeboats are called all weather lifeboats, there, there are limits beyond which we wouldn't go out anyway. So it's it's a great question. That was a politician's answer, but not not particularly. Um, next, we have a question from Simon Robinson. Uh, Miss Robinson, do you want to ask your question? Um, it's okay if you don't want to. I can read it out. Um, he said that. Do you think that the RNLI should get the government or public? Uh, purse contribution, or is it possibly better being funded as it is now, uh, the People's Emergency Service? Yeah, um, I don't think we would ever ever find ourselves in a position where we would want to come under any sort of government umbrella or, or government funding. We've always been always been a charity. Uh, one of the resolutions that Sir William Hillary set out when we were established was that we'd be supported by donations and annual subscriptions. That hasn't changed. I think the, da the danger is, Simon, that if we, uh, if we start taking government money, we start taking government direction. And by remaining an independent charity, it gives us the autonomy to, to operate in, in the way that we know best. And yeah, being, being fairly crass about it, we've got almost 200 years of experience of how, how to run a life-saving service. And dare I say, civil servants might like to, to meddle in, in some of that. Um, and a question more related to your time at MTs. Um, are there any experiences that you had at Merchant Taylors or any activities you took part in that helped you gain the skills required to serve in the RNLI? Oh, that's quite, a that's quite a tame one. When you said related to my time at Taylors, I, I cringed inwardly. Um, I, I don't know. I was, I was in, in the Royal Navy section of, of the CCF. Um, but more because they offered the best field days than, than anything else. I, I, I really don't think so. I mean, if, if, if you'd have told me when, when I left Taylor's in, in 93 that, you know, I'd be a, be a lifeboat man and I'd be volunteering for the, for the RNI for 23 years, I, I'd probably have laughed at you. It's, um, yeah, not at all, but I don't know. I guess, I guess the whole, the whole ethos of, the whole ethos of, of Taylor's has made me the person I am, which perhaps makes me more more suitable for volunteering than, than others. But there's there's nothing in particular. I don't I don't think. Um, and then I've got one for you, if that's okay. Um, I assume that some missions can be very tense uh, and traumatic. So would there be any kind of mental support or help uh, following missions? Yeah, that is that's a great question, Archie. Thanks, and yeah. You know, there was there was a slide on that that I took it out because it, it was just going a little bit too dark. Yeah, we we do we do go to some pretty traumatic things. We we see things that yeah nobody should be seeing in a paid capacity, let alone in, in a in a volunteer capacity. But we we run um, a, a trim service, a trauma risk management. It's it's something that was established in established in the military. Uh, it's peer to peer support based on uh, on watchful waiting. So. After a traumatic incident, trim practitioners, I, I am a trim practitioner, we will get called to go to the station. We normally normally talk to the crew as a group, um, talk them through their experiences and just look for look for markers and indicators that, that these individuals might need 
some additional support. It's not counselling. It's definitely not counselling. Um, it's not psychotherapy. It's it's just talking about it and to, but talking about it in a structured way so we, we can see if anybody is likely to need any additional support. It's a really valuable thing. We've only been doing it since 2017. And I wish I wish we'd been doing it 23 years ago, if I'm honest with you. Um, we have another question from um, Andy Connor. Um, he said, um, as Shore based launching authority, you have um, considerable responsibility in making a launching decision. Um, is it usually the Coast Guard who asks you to launch or like who does ask you to launch? Yeah, that is a great question. Thanks. So the, the, convention, the conventional means of, of calling a lifeboat is however the distress, distress call is made, it will end up with the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard can determine the most appropriate asset for that job. So not necessarily based on location, but the, the type of boats that are available. The Coast Guard will page the launch authorities um, but it's, it's a tasking request. It's not an instruction to launch, it's a tasking request. So then there'll be a conversation between the launching authority and the Coast Guard. Summary of, the, summary of the job will be given and the launch authority can either accept or decline the launch request. If it's accepted, the crew get paged and there's still that one last conversation between the launch authority and the coxswain or the helmsman before the boat launches, just to say, Coast Guard are happy, I'm happy, you're now in control of this lifeboat, are you happy to take this boat and this, this crew out? So there, there is you know, it's a big responsibility to make the initial call, but there's a, a, a triple lock system, if you like, and at any stage in that process, anybody can say, no, this isn't right. And that, that decision can be made without any fear of judgment or consequence afterwards. And there are times when we say no, Um, we've just got one more, um, unless any more sent through. But uh, you mentioned that 95% of people working at RNLI are volunteers. Um, how would you go about sourcing these volunteers? How would we go about sourcing volunteers? So the, the so many different ways. We've got a we've got a, a volunteering site on our on our website. So if you're interested in volunteering, you can go and look on that. Um, conversation starters with people like me to get people involved. If if people are interested in becoming operational volunteers, the best thing to do is to to email the station or walk through the door of the station and just just ask the question. Lifeboat stations will not traditionally recruit a crew through websites unless they're really really short because there's always a massive waiting list. But the way to get put on that list is is to ask. But if you know if somebody's interested in volunteering opportunities out the back of the day's chat, which would be great, the, the best thing to do would be to look on our look on our website, search for volunteering opportunities. Thank you. Um, I um, apologise because I know that there are umpteen questions, but we are coming quite um, becoming quite late now, um, and I don't want to hold everybody up. But there was one question um, from David Ellis, who I know you know very well. And David, I wonder if you want to ask your question. Um, and uh, over to you. Be Maybe gentle. You can with unmute. Be gentle with me. <laughs> Are you unmuting? Try again. <laughs> That'd be worth it now, Dave. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, it might not be that quite exciting now. Um, you probably answered it already. Um, uh, how did your time in the Navy, CCF, help or indeed hinder your career since? Um, and uh, yeah, well, that's that's probably it. Um, uh, I mean, I, th I think I think they were chalk and cheese, really, Dave. I mean, I'm not going to start telling stories about what it was like in the Navy section of the CCF today because I get myself into all sorts of trouble uh, and others as well. I mean, it from doing that, it was obvious I have some of some affinity with the sea. I and mean, before before I was in the CCF, I'd never I'd never been 
to see in, in any real capacity. So I suppose it, it showed me that the sea was an exciting place and a place that I like spending time, which perhaps perhaps gave me the encouragement. Um, we didn't do a lot of boat handling stuff, didn't do an awful lot on nav. It was mainly tying knots, marching and going on field trips to uh, to HMS Kent in, uh, in, in Portsmouth. But yeah, I, I, I guess somewhere in inside would, would, would have been that recognition that that I, I've got an affinity for the sea, which perhaps steered me towards volunteering with a, with a marine-based organisation rather than something on the land. Awesome. Thank right, you. Yeah. Thanks, right. David. Sorry, carry on. Well, <laughs> well yeah, just it's it's an amazing thing that you that you do and you've been doing for so so long. So, um, yeah. Well done, mate. <laughs> it's lovely to see you as well. Um, Adam, I, I, I couldn't really say it better myself. It is amazing what you do with such grace. And thank you very much for sharing your experiences and explaining quite, you know, about what the RNLI does. And I'm sure um, that you've made it sound like it's really just like water off a duck's back. But I can't imagine what it must be like to get into that boat when it's pitch black knowing that there are people out there who need your help um, so thank you very much for sharing that and thank you very much everyone for joining us and for your questions and I apologize that we haven't been able to get to all of them but I might just pop them down in an email to you Adam and perhaps uh, ask see if you can um, enlighten yeah um, I, will, I will get them all answered Emma Ab thank absolutely, you. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> that's very kind and also thank you to Archie and to Neat for being our, our lower six boys tonight and for helping us out. That's been really helpful. Um, and just to let you all know that there is another NPS Together talk on Tuesday of next week, which is all about FAB because it's 50 years since FAB was first um, started here at Merchant Taylor School. So we've got some speakers there from across the ages. You can book in the usual way, um, but Thank you so much again, Adam. It's been a fantastic talk and um, we look forward to seeing you in June at school. Oh, you're really welcome. Thank you ever so much for, for inviting me along. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Bye.